Uh, thank you. Uh, I am a male, and I am a, I was a family caregiver, despite all of the statistics. Uh, <clears throat> we had a, a very normal family. Uh, married, had three children. My youngest child was <clears throat> 17 months old, late afternoon <clears throat> in late September of 1980. Uh, the bottom fell out of our world. Excuse me if I get emotional, but it's still kind of fresh and it's kind of tough to talk about it sometimes. But the doctors came in <clears throat> to my wife and I and said, your son has been diagnosed with the infantile form of Lou Gehrig's disease. <clears throat> there's no cure. There's, n there's nothing that can be done. You take him home. We went to Eggleston Memorial Hospital, Children's Memorial Hospital in Atlanta. We lived in Plains at the time. He said, I'm going to let you take him home tonight. And if he's alive when you get him home, you love him as long as you have him because it won't be long. Folks, if you haven't been there, <clears throat> there's no way to understand the stress, the emotions, the grief that ensues as a result of such a statement. Um, it changed our lives forever. I'll never be the same person again. God was gracious to us <clears throat> and allowed us to keep that young fella for almost 12 years. The doctors missed the prognosis. They did not miss the diagnosis as much as we denied it and denied it and denied it. We went through 10, <clears throat> a little better than 10 years, 10 years and three months to be exact, of continuous anxiety over not knowing whether or not you'd wake up the next morning and he'd be there with you alive. The, uh, <clears throat> the emotions are just indescribable. The support is non-existent. It's not because people don't care. <clears throat> it's not because people don't want to do it. People don't know what to do. Our own <clears throat> family members didn't want to talk about it. They didn't want to hear about it. Friends were uncomfortable with it. Um, you, we were isolated. For the first three years after that diagnosis, it was pretty easy to deny it after the initial shock because everything went fine. Uh, he was, from all outward appearances, a normal little boy. Uh, other than the fact that he could not walk, he was confined to a wheelchair. Uh, I carried him most everywhere to, to keep the stigma of the wheelchair away. He was a little fella, I could tote him, it was no problem. Uh, you'd walk down through the mall and somebody would say, why don't you put that big boy down and let him walk? You know, well, little did they know, you know, if I put him down, he sat there. But <clears throat> those kinds of things for the first few years, you know, were fairly easy to take care of. And then at the age of five uh, came the first real obstacle for us, and he developed pneumonia. And uh, uh, the doctors said, you know, this is it. Uh, respiratory uh, functions are, are very weak, and he will not be able to survive this. Uh, well, he was a fighter, as some of you know. Uh, and uh, he didn't give up. He fought, and he came through it as any normal child would. But having gone through that stress and the strain and the anxieties and, and <clears throat> all for three years and, and 10 days of intense hospitalization and not leaving his bedside <coughs> took a toll on his mom. And uh, we got home from the hospital about noon one afternoon. And about the middle of the afternoon, she had a com complete emotional breakdown. And for the next five years, she had to fight severe depression. And so I had two older children who were perfectly normal in every aspect of every sense of the word, who uh, had normal lives that, <clears throat> that we had to be able to maintain. I had a, a wife who was emotionally depleted. 
and a son who was terminally ill. And again, uh, a lot of caring people, loving people, but very, very little support. The, um, you know, as parents, <clears throat> we expect to bring a child into the world and to love and, and teach and protect and nurture. We don't expect to have to learn, teach them how to die. And all of a sudden, you're thrust into the role of teaching your child how to die. And when that child turns to you in a, from a hospital bed and says, Dad, I'm not going to die, am I? There's not an ounce of anything in you that can cause comfort or bring comfort to that child. And folks, let me tell you, <clears throat> this, this experience that we went through for 10 years, and by the way, <clears throat> he died um, this December the 29th, about two years ago, and it was a very sudden death. He, was, he went through Christmas and everything was fine. Late one afternoon, he started running a little fever, and within six hours, he dies in my arms um, at home. So even the death process itself, I didn't have, I wasn't prepared for it. Ten years of knowing, I still wasn't prepared. Uh, he just died. 